Oh, good morning, First Baptist Church family. Uh, this is my second installment of Teaching Sunday School through Zoom. And today we're going to look at the life of uh, Leah and Rachel. Uh, Kobe will be preaching from uh, Genesis 29 verses 15 through 28 this week. Um, but then our Sunday school text is going to be looking um, after uh, this text. We'll be looking more at what's happening in chapter chapter 30. But to give us some background, we'll start with uh, today's sermon text or title and entitled "And Then There Was Leah." So chapter 29, verse 15. Laban said to him, just because you're my relative, should you work for me for nothing? Tell me what your wages should be. Now Laban had two daughters. The older was named Leah and the younger was named Rachel. Leah had ordinary eyes, but Rachel was shapely and beautiful. Jacob loved Rachel, so he answered Laban, I'll work for you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban replied, better that I give her to you than some other man stay with me. So Jacob worked seven years for Rachel, and they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife, for my time is completed. I want to sleep with her. So Laban invited all the men of the place to a feast, and that evening Laban took his daughter Leah and gave her to Jacob, and he slept with her. And Laban gave his slave Zilpah to his daughter Leah as her slave. When morning came, there was Leah. So he said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? Wasn't it for Rachel that I worked for you? Why have you deceived me? Laban answered, it is not the custom in this place to give the younger daughter in marriage before the firstborn. Um, complete this wed week of wedding celebration, and we will also give you this younger one in return for working yet another seven years for me. And Jacob did just that. He finished the week of celebration, and Laban gave him his daughter Rachel as his wife. And Laban gave his slave Bilah to his daughter Rachel as her slave. Jacob slept with Rachel also, and indeed he loved Rachel more than Leah, and he worked for Laban another seven years. So the rest of the story that we'll be talking about today um, begins in chapter 29 and it, it starts at verse 31 and then it takes us on over in uh, to chapter chapter 30 and it continues on uh, through about verse 24 in Genesis chapter 30. But it's interesting to note that uh, we can, it's interesting to note that Laban has deceived Jacob in, in this um, deal that he made with, with him. Um, we see that originally Jacob was working seven years to uh, earn Rachel as his bride. But when his time became completed, uh, Laban did an old switcheroo in the in the marriage tent that night and gave away his daughter Leah um, to Jacob instead of what he had promised uh, his daughter Rachel. It's interesting to note that uh, earlier in this chapter that whenever Jacob meets Rachel, it was kind of that proverbial love at first sight. Um, and we're told in this uh, excerpt that we just read that Rachel was, oh, shapely and beautiful. And so, um, we see that really uh, that he has a strong physical attraction to Rachel, and that's originally why he asked for her uh, in marriage. We see that 
this uh, arrangement is uh, reminiscent of a provision in the law of Moses that permitted certain slaves to work seven years for their freedom. During this time, men did not really buy their wives, but rather they did customarily pay for a bride um, to their future wife's family to compensate them for the care and protection that they provided the woman prior to her marriage. Um, so during this time, Jacob is almost 50 years old that he works seven years for his wife. And in true romantic fashion, um, we're told that these Seven years felt but like a mere few days because his love was so strong for her. And uh, this, this type of love can make any Hollywood romance novel um, uh, uh, jealous because this is the type of romance that uh, we all desire deep down inside, right? We just want somebody that will just love us and uh, seek us out no matter what. And we see this kind of strong desire that Jacob has with his commitment to Rachel. And so um, what we'll see here after the text that I read to you, starting in verse 31, um, we see that Leah, what we're told that Leah was unloved by Jacob um, because he really loved Rachel, sorry for my, my pauses, but I, it's a hard for me to keep them straight in my mind, and I don't want to want to misspeak. So uh, we know that he really, really loved Rachel, but Leah just uh, by happenstance becomes his wife, and he has to still honor his marriage vows to her. Um, but what we see is eventually a deep sadness envelops Leah, and it really overshadows all that she she does. Um, she's unloved by Jacob, and everyone knows it. And similar, similarly, a deep sadness occurs month in and month out um, for Rachel, um, we find out, because she is barren. And that barrenness hovers over her life like a dark cloud. Um, everybody sees her and they know that um, she is deficient because she does, has not provided Jacob any sons. And um, when in the, in the historical context, um, good, right, or indifferent today, how we feel about it, um, women's worth was based upon their ability to uh, bear children, especially male children. And so um, what, when we look at their lives, we see that um, Leah has deficiencies, and we also see that ha Rachel has deficiencies. But their deficiencies are different, and so um, they both have some insecurities. And what we see here because of our problem with original sin is that insecurity um, always breeds competition. Uh, we'll see, we see this in today's society, right? Just like we see um, in this text, we see Leah competing for the love of Jacob. She only wants him to love her and um, and then we see at the same time Rachel just wants Jacob to father children by her. And so uh, these insecurities lead to uh, competition. And we see that with, uh, in today, we still see how women compete today with each other. Um, we see uh, even men do this. Um, it's just not just not women. They compete with one another for value, accolades, prominence, love, and affection. Um, we see that with Leah, every baby that she has, she hopes that to experience Jacob's love. Um, 
she wants what Rachel has, right? And so the arrival of each of Leah's babies reminds Rachel of the one thing she lacks, a fertile womb, and she wants what Leah has. Um, the, the study that, I, that I'm teaching from today calls this affection deficit disorder. Um, we see that each woman suffers with a sinful competitive spirit that, um, like I said, we can refer to as affection deficit disorder. Uh, Jacob's affection isn't quite enough while Rachel's womb remains empty. Leah has what Rachel wants, the affection of sons. Um, so we see that a packed nursery doesn't replace the empty heart of Jacob's dutiful nightly visit into Leah's tents. Um, Rachel possesses what Leah wants, and Leah craves the affection given by loving husbands to loved wives. Um, we see that each woman lives with continual disappointment as she focuses on what the other has. A competitive spirit is born on the wings of insecurity, and women compensate for the thing they lack, rather insecurity, um, by focusing on the one thing in which they excel, Leah's womb and Rachel's beauty. Uh, it takes Jacob the man on the run from God even longer to come to the end of himself. Uh, he has a beautiful wife, the clamor of other women for his attention, increasing family and wealth uh, are poor substitutes for what's missing in his life. He too has affection deficit disorder. Um, what we'll see here is that a number of truths uh, emerge from this story. And one of those truths is the dull ache of living outside of the Garden of Eden affects the hearts of both men and women. Competition with other women is a symptom of a spiritual problem. An obsession with gaining wealth is also a sign of a sim or also a sign of a spiritual problem. Uh, we all, we also see in these these stories that uh, the awareness of deficiency reminds both men and women that no human relationship or work can fill the void inherited in the hearts of all when Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit. Uh, another thing that we learn by reading these stories is outward beauty cannot erase sin in the heart. Full nurseries cannot empty the heart of sin and hard work and the accumulation of possessions cannot expunge sin from the heart. Um, so each and every one of us is born with affection deficit disorder uh, some feel it more acutely than others. Uh, women substitute personal beauty, the love and affection of husbands and children for the affection of Christ. Uh, we see this every time we turn on the TV, right? We see all these commercials for um, the latest beauty products that will make you look younger. Um, there's a whole industry uh of beauty that makes this, we see uh, commercial after commercial that you need this to look pretty, um, or we see uh, plastic surgery commercials of, you know, we're here to make you the best version of you possible, and we have this whole uh, Instagram culture, if you will, um, or just uh, social media in general that. Um, gives us this belief of and tells us everything that we need to have to be happy, right? Um, if we have, uh, I can't even begin to name off things that are advertised, but if you look a certain way and you have this many followers and uh, you wear this brand of clothes, then you are successful and you, and you fit in and you have found um, success. Uh, and for men, we'll see that they substitute beautiful women and personal kingdom building for a relationship with Christ. And so um, not, it's not always all men, women can be guilty of this as well, but um, we want to, as men, accumulate as much stuff as we can. 
and there's this whole culture of um, I'm sure many of you heard this term uh, trophy wife and so uh, if a man has a trophy wife and he has a big house and a boat and a lot of disposable income and a lot of money then he feels like he is successful but um, what we really learn here is kind of what Leah learns when she has this epiphany when her fourth son Judah is born. She says in uh, chapter 29, verse 35, that this time I will praise the Lord. Uh, and so she discovers that neither husband or sons, but only the Lord can give her what she longs for. And this is kind of the same thing that's echoed in the New Testament when Paul writes in uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. He writes, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, we see that only the Spirit can fill the craving of the heart of those that belong to Christ with the affection of Christ because ultimately that is what the soul longs for. I know many times, in our, there's been times in my personal life that I, I definitely know this to be true, is that we're, we've been searching for something that we've either thought that we've missed out on, or uh, something that I needed to have, um, or something that I needed to buy or purchase to satisfy a longing in my soul, or there was something that um, I needed to do, a group of friends that I needed. Um, for at, at one point, I know I've shared with you that, like you know, I was hanging out with a party crowd before I before I came back to Christ, and so. Um, a lot of times we do a bunch of stuff just to try to fill this void that we really don't know what that void is. And we see this here in the story in the life of Leah and Rachel. Leah has this void because her husband doesn't love her. And unfortunately, we see this uh, pandemic, epidemic, I'm not sure the right word to use there, but we see it in the family now, right? Um, we see people that don't take their marriage vows seriously because um, we see it now more as a business contract is that, well, I'll marry you as long as I'm getting something out of this until something better comes along. And we see the divorce rate, you know, well over 50% now. And, and it's tragic and sad because uh, a lot of these desires and longings that we have that we try to fulfill with people and possessions is just an empty void that we can't fill because of the original sin of Adam and Eve. Um, and that is that fellowship with Christ. Um, because ultimately that's what our souls deep down long for is they long for a personal relationship with Christ of where we can have communion with him and have that relationship established. Um, so a couple of questions you can ponder as we continue reading on um, about the life of Jacob is uh, think back of what things captured Jacob's attention when he arrives at Padan Aram and well, those two things can tell us a lot about Jacob's character, right? And his future agenda. And so when we think back on that, um, what were the two things that he first saw? One of the first things he saw was uh, a whale and a bunch of flocks, right? Uh, and he also saw Rachel. And um, so we can kind of see how Jacob is um, a schemer, uh, for, a, for a lack of a better term. I hate to call one of God's chosen people a schemer, but uh, in all reality, that's what Jacob was. 
and we can kind of see how the wheels start turning. Um, and then later on, I think next week, maybe we'll talk about how, uh, about how uh, Jacob begins kind of tricks Laban uh, into uh, growing his wealth personally for Laban and for himself and see how uh, that turns out for for Jacob. So um, it's my hope that uh, today we've been able to shed a little light through uh, the life of Leah and Rachel about how we ourselves have uh, an affection deficit disorder of how we try to plug in affection for possessions and relationships um, instead of uh, the true affection of Christ that our soul longs for. Uh, the only thing that will truly satisfy us is um, our relationship with Christ. So let's pray uh, and we'll complete our lesson today. Dear God, may we ever be mindful that what you desire the most from us is um, a relationship with us, God, of where we walk with you daily and we commune with you um, in a personal way, God. Uh, you have created us to be in fellowship with you, God, and I pray, Lord, that we would seek you. Um, we're told that if you, we seek you, that we will find you, God. I pray, Lord, during these trying times that you would give us wisdom and discernment on how best to um, congregate together, God. And I pray, Lord, that you would keep us safe and um, be with those that, who are affected by, by this pandemic, God, that um, if their health is impacted, that you would be with them. And if they are impacted other ways, God, I pray, Lord, that uh, this community uh, would show up for them and show them what it means to be uh, in the family of believers, God. Just go with us and guide us and protect us and help us to be um, a light, the light on the hill for you, God. It is in your son's holy name that we pray. Amen.